Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and begin to fall in love with what you are hearing, please hit that subscribe button and don't forget the notification bell. Set that to all so you'll know every time I upload, which tends to be daily. If you would like to learn how to become a member of Back to Ashes or would like to tip me with a cup of coffee, that information can be found down below in the description box. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Scary Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I was eight. My sister was five. We got it in our heads to walk home from school instead of waiting for our parents. They were late. It was a pretty rural area back then. We were enjoying the sun and feeling grown up when a silver sedan slowed down by us. A man with a mostly bald head, black gloves, and a big smile leaned over and swung the passenger door out. We had to step around it. He said that our mom was sick and he was sent to pick us up. I started getting a really bad feeling. I had never seen this man before. He said it's okay get in. Do you like candy? He gestured to a small pile of Halloween candy on his burgundy seat. His eyes were on my sister. He only glanced at me. I took my sister's hand and tugged her along while saying no, like my dad taught me. He started backing up, keeping us in his open door. He told us to get in the car over and over again. The smile was gone, and I will never forget the way his gloved hands squeezed the steering wheel. He shouted at us to get in the fucking car. I was starting to cry and was beyond scared. That's when he tried to grab my sister. I yelled at her to run, and we did. The maniac actually kept backing his car up. There were only fields and abandoned lots. I heard him slam on the brakes. I knew we had to hide. I pulled my sister over this old wooden driveway-like thing, built over a ditch, and into one in the abandoned lots. It was severely overgrown. I pulled my sister down onto the ground in some really tall grass. She was crying. I put my finger to my lips, and she got quiet. We stayed hiding on our stomachs when I heard the sounds of a car door closing. Footsteps walking through the gravel on the side of the road, swearing. More footsteps. A passing car. A car door closing. An engine. A car driving through gravel. We stayed and stayed. I felt frozen. I was extremely scared. After a few more cars whizzed by, I slowly raised up my head. He was gone. We ran home, our hands glued together. We made it home safely. That was one of the most terrifying days of my life. Oh, and our mother wasn't pleased. She was actually happy we were safe, but she told us to never, ever do that again and just wait on her next time to pick us up. This event took place back when I was in college and occurred way before things like cell phones existed. I was an undergraduate at the time and attended a school located in the Appalachian Mountains. The school was in a small town and I soon came to realize that the townies, that is, people who grew up there, didn't care much for us students. I was a junior at the time and it happened during a cold winter. I had heard a story regarding a certain townie that liked to frequent a popular bar called The Club. 
it was placed frequented by both students and townies. The way the story went, this guy who came out on Saturday evenings to pick up students. The past weekend, he had sat down at a table, uninvited, where a group of students were drinking beer. He just sat there, silent and unwelcome. Eventually, he grabbed the thigh of a male student. He then assaulted them when the student grabbed him by the arm and told him to let go. Supposedly, the students all had to go to the hospital due to injuries sustained during the beating. The owner didn't do a thing about it either, also being a townie. The next Saturday night rolled around, and I told my buddies, let's teach this asshole a lesson. I was raised up by my dad not to be a victim and to look out for my friends. I played pool and poker to help put myself through school, so I knew how to handle myself. Having heard the townie like to punch his victims in the solar plexus, I got some magazines and taped them around my torso with a roll of electrical tape. I also got an empty Coke bottle and put it in my jacket pocket. We waited until around 10 p.m., then headed over to the bar and got a table, leaving one chair empty beside me. We were enjoying a pitcher of Pap's Blue Ribbon when one of my friends told me that he was there now. We made sure not to look at him and kept on drinking. Eventually, he came over and sat down in the empty chair beside me. Casually, I turned to look at him and smiled. Sure enough, he immediately grabbed me by the leg. Hey there, fella, I said, smiling as I took another sip of my beer. He had a hard grip on my thigh, and he stared back at me, not saying a word. Well, you certainly aren't a shy one, I said, and my friends all laughed. It had grown silent. Everyone in the bar was watching now. I had a nice pinch of Copenhagen snuff between my cheek and gums. I spit it into one of his eyes, which caused him to involuntarily close both. Immediately, I punched the throat as hard as I could, knocking the creep backwards. He fell out of his seat, landing flat on his ass. Take it outside, yelled the owner from behind the bar. We stepped out into the back alley, followed by the townie. His eyes blazed with anger as he quickly came towards us. He took a quick swing, which I blocked as I pulled out the Coke bottle, gripping it by the neck. I swung back hard, landing a savage blow against his thick skull. I felt it connect with a satisfying thud. His head snapped back and he stumbled. I kicked his legs out from under him. Then we circled around him and started kicking him with our still-toed Doc Martens. He tried to get up, but we just kept on kicking him as hard as we could, working up a good sweat. He must have tried not to yell or scream, but soon enough, he was crying like a baby. This went on for quite a while, until we eventually heard the whining sirens approaching. Oh shit, let's go, I shouted and we legged it out of there as fast as we could. Later, we were told an ambulance had come to the bar to cart off the unconscious townie on a stretcher. Needless to say, we didn't return to the club anytime soon. One time the next year, I went back and saw a townie sitting in a wheelchair beside the bar. He looked at me, but he wasn't so big anymore and trembled a lot. He looked my way eventually and immediately broke eye contact. He never said one word either. Oh well, I thought. He had brought it upon himself. There are consequences to your actions. I grew up in a large estate surrounded by nature. It was very isolating and I had no neighbors until I moved out. The house itself is big and old, which prompted many comments from friends comparing it to a horror movie house. 
When I turned 17, I moved out to go to university, which didn't please my grandparents, who were the other house residents, so I avoided coming back. Ever since I moved out, I started having vivid dreams of walking alone at night, something I never did before. I roamed the streets around it, always alone and always searching for someone. I was annoyed with the frequency of the dream as they came multiple times a week. At the time, I started having other odd dreams that ended up in weird coincidences. I jumped to places I hadn't been in years, and the next day I got invited to go there. I dreamt of random objects and got gifted them. The same thing happened with people. Still, those dreams came and went, but the dream of walking alone persisted. I once went back to a party there a few years later and decided to take a ride back downtown so I could go home. I hopped in a car with some relatives and another car was following us. It was dark and the second car got lost. I called the people in the other car and oriented them to get back onto the main road. We waited for them in front of an old slaughterhouse and mentioned how I always dreamt about walking down those roads almost every night, but that I never got to do so. The people in the car all believed in spiritualism, and one of them said I should pay more attention to those dreams. I shrugged and let it go. When I turned 20, I decided to move back to my grandparents and go back to living in that house. The dreams got more frequent. After a few months of moving back, they had to leave town for a few days, but I couldn't come with them as I had to shoot some more things for uni. They left on a Friday afternoon, and I invited a friend to sleep over with me. She had to take a train and then call an Uber to get to my house, something she had done multiple times. She ended up being late and arrived in my town almost at midnight. It would have taken about half an hour for her to get here from the train station, but as time passed, she wouldn't arrive at my house. I was getting desperate, and she called me at 1 o'clock in the morning to tell me the drivers refused to drive around those roads at night and dropped her off at a road. She sent me a picture that looked like the end of my street, so I told her to just walk and that I would find her. It was a short walk that would last around two minutes, but she never came. She called me again, saying she was lost and sent me a picture of a house. I told her to stay there and that I would go looking for her. I walked around those streets alone in a white nightgown and pen curls in my hair. I roamed these streets for what felt like hours. I considered getting the car keys and searching for her, but... I don't know how to drive. There are a lot of cliffs around here, and I went around all of them trying to find the house she sent me a picture of. I recorded some videos and sent them to another friend trying to get advice. She told me to call an Uber to pick her up, and I did that. I kept trying to find the house by the number just in case. The Uber arrived, and after I calmed down, I started questioning my friend about the identity of the woman who let her go inside the house. She described her to me, and I decided to look for her, so that I could be thankful for. I called another one of my friends, who would be joining us the following day, to tell her about the story. Her boyfriend picked it up and said she was in the hospital as she had poured boiling water on her hands and had to have it looked after. I noticed she had called me at the same time it happened, and, coincidentally, it was one o'clock in the morning, the time my lost friend called me to tell me she was lost. After that night, the dream of walking into the woods stopped. I had driven by the area multiple times, searching for the house and never found it. I live in fear that I will have to walk there by myself again, and something worse will happen.
I've told this story before, but I wanted to share it again because it has more details and it got a lot more attention than I would have thought. I'm telling this story again because there's more details I didn't share with the first one. So, for reference, I'm a 19-year-old male, trans, female to male actually, and on my Lyft app, I just put my preferred name and gender because I could, as well as a nice selfie of me. So, I'm in the system as a guy. When I first moved to the city that I live in for college, I didn't have a car and would ride my bike or walk everywhere, depending on the distance. My work was a little under a mile, and my school was about two. So, a 30-minute bike ride to school and 20-minute walk to work. I liked those walks and helped me clear my head. But as these months got hotter, it became more unbearable to walk for even those short 20 minutes especially when I had to go to work and I would be all sweaty. I started using Lyft religiously once I discovered the wait and save option. Most of the time, it wouldn't. Even make me wait that long? Sometimes it was even shorter than the more expensive options. I was pulling out easily 10 plus lifts a week between getting to work and everywhere else. Since I'm not paying bills while I'm living with my dad, I had a pretty decent amount of expendable income and was able to manage my budget to still have money left over after all those trips, in case you were wondering. A couple months ago, I had ordered my weight and saved lift and left to wait outside a couple minutes early. I'm looking at my phone, taking note of my driver's car and my driver's appearance. I walk out to our driveway and see a very similar car to the little icon that Lyft gives you. It's like a small white sedan for both the icon and this car. And unless you tried looking for the little details, they looked the same. But luckily, I do. And I noticed that this wasn't my driver. Plus, it said my real one was two minutes from me. I just assumed he was waiting on someone else, maybe a friend of a neighbor, or maybe he's looking for directions. Every possible logical explanation for why he's sitting in my driveway, staring at me, runs through my mind. I feel awkward, so I take the mail out and go back around the back door and set it in our kitchen. I go back out. He's still sitting there. We make eye contact and he rolls down his window. Maybe he's just lost? Let me see if I can help. The driver of this car was a Middle Eastern man in his 30s, I want to say. I didn't think to get a physical description because I didn't think I needed to. He pulls out his phone, and it very clearly shows my profile and says that he is my driver. I look down at my phone again. My actual driver is a black man in his 40s. I guess through a tinted window, which he had, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but since he rolled down his window, I was able to. Now, I don't know why, but for some reason, I just trusted him. I've been living as a guy for almost two years now and passed pretty well. Creepy men had been taken out of my radar the way women have to keep them in. I haven't been catcalled, assaulted, harassed, and just assumed that I was immune to kidnapping and trafficking for some reason. My first thought was that Lyft sent me two drivers, and the cars being so similar was just a funny coincidence. I tell the guy my theory, and he just asks if I want to take his car instead. I say, yeah, I guess I will since you're here first. Then, my actual driver pulls up. He sits stationary in the street and rolls down his window when I walk over. I think to myself, this is awkward, like seeing your ex on a date, and I toddle over to explain what's going on. I tell him I'm gonna get in the other guy's car because he was here first, 
and my driver says I should probably go with whoever is on my phone. At this point, I'm just desperate to get into someone's car or I'm going to be late to work. So I figured that makes the most sense. I was just worried that one of them wouldn't get paid or else I would have to pay for both. I'm still thinking this is Lyft's fault. I turn around to go tell the original driver I'm going to go with my real one on my phone, but before I do, he drives off. Weird. Guess he wanted to get out of there to catch his ride. I get into my guy's car and settle in, and it wasn't until we started driving that he makes the point. So, that was really weird, right? I hadn't thought of it like that. I metaphorically rub my chin for a moment and realize, holy shit, it kind of was. I ask my driver, has that ever happened to you before? He's been a Lyft driver for over 10 years, and he hasn't. My heart might as well have stopped as the realization dawned on me. Oh my God, that guy must have been pretending to be my driver on purpose. That sudden fear that I hadn't felt in years since before I came out as trans and lived as an attractive woman had punched me in the gut all at once. And then I realized that men go through this shit too. My palms were sweaty, and I tried to make small talk to change the subject. We joke around a bit as I try to hide my increasing anxiety and paranoia. I tip him well, thank him, and he lets me know he's going to share what happened on a forum of fellow drivers to let them know what had happened, so that made me feel a little bit better. First thing I do when I get into work is take one of my emergency anxiety meds with shaky hands, clock in, and book it to our outside break area. I called my dad, tell him what just happened. He tells me to make a report to Lyft, and I do. When I called them, they took it very seriously. I was still at this point trying to rationalize it as a server error, but no one had ever seen anything like it before. Not my experienced driver, no one I knew, not the Lyft representative, nothing. The woman I spoke to was really kind and appreciated her genuine concern. She told me she was going to send me an email and to send any physical proof I had of the event. I didn't really have any. I spent about 15 minutes outside and didn't tell anyone aside my dad for a couple of weeks. The whole thing was traumatic, especially after I had time alone to reflect and think about everything that had happened. A couple days later, though, my dad got me in a car. So, hey, thanks, Dad. I analyzed every detail. My anxiety took full control and made me a total paranoid maniac. My dad somehow managed to give me every right to work until he got me the car which was a total surprise, by the way. I did not know he was doing that. I think back on it still. The tenant windows, the timing, the similarity to the cars, the fact that no one has heard of this happening, the fact that if I had gotten in his car, we would have driven off and my actual driver would have just reported me as a no-show and no one would have known for hours later that I was possibly missing because I was going to be at work. I did some research, and the general consensus was this was likely a trafficker who had access to Lyft servers and looked for repeating customers like me, someone who was so used to hopping in and out of the guards that they probably have their guard down. In their eyes, I was a young, I like to think, conventionally attractive male. It could have been for homosexual trafficking or labor. Although, on both ends, they would be very disappointed. For weeks after, I carried pepper spray in my hand and a knife in my pocket and wallet. I also hid a couple in my car, 
which I realize isn't the safest if I get pulled over or anything. But so far, I've been fine. Still look over my shoulder and avoid lifts at all costs. I deleted the app for a while. Stay safe. Read the license plates and check your gut, people. Not all of us are so lucky to have our real driver pull up at the perfect time. That guy might have just saved my life. Let me start by saying I'm not a danger to myself or anything. I just have such a strange feeling and want to know what everyone else might make of it. I am also actively in therapy, so consider that box checked. I might just be a nutcase, and I'm fully prepared to accept that. So, for as long as I can remember, I have been actually aware of my own mortality and the impermanence of everything. Just the fact that we will die one day, and mostly of this stuff that we see as valuable, won't matter in the end. Cars will break down and rust. Buildings will decay. Clothes will get worn out. School test scores will be irrelevant, etc. Literally, for as long as I can recall, from a very young age, it's just been present in me and has something that I have known and accepted, which has caused great peace, apathy, gratitude, depression, and overwhelming anxiety all at once, which has been very strange to process. I also always had a feeling I wouldn't live very long, and not in a morbid way. Simply something else that I had a strange feeling of, knowing and acceptance for. I remember when I was probably 11 or 12, I actually told my grandma that I couldn't see myself living past 16 years old, and trying to picture a future in my adult life just felt like looking into a fuzzy hole. I swear that is what my child self was like. I know it's bizarre to think a kid would think like this, but I did. At that time, I felt like I was actively fulfilling whatever purpose I had on earth. Like I was meant to be there living my kid life, and it was furthering the plot line of my life and the people's lives I was involved in, if that makes any sense. But any time I tried to picture a future past, my teen years, it just seemed like I was looking into a cloud of mist or a fuzzy hole. I couldn't even picture myself or my life right after high school. It's just like it wouldn't come to me in any capacity. Anyway, I lived with that feeling and just moved along with my life until October 11th of 2010. Now, 90% of the following is based off of what I've heard from other people because I don't remember a majority of it. I had been hanging out with my best friend that evening at a park about four blocks down from my own house. I had just adopted a puppy and we were playing with her. Around 7 p.m. when the sun was just starting to go down, we decided it was time to head back to our homes and went our separate ways. I was one block away from my house and almost completely across the catwalk, connecting me to another park, which was full of people, when I was hit by a car going 35 to 45 miles per hour, and he just didn't stop. I was 15 years old. I don't know how my body reacted. I've heard from different people that he ran over my body, that I flew up onto his windshield and over the top, and that he hit me and I was propelled across the street. There's nothing but eyewitnesses to confirm, but I had some nasty road rash that seemed more consistent with having my face and body dragged across the asphalt in some way. I don't know. Several people from the park ran over to me and my puppy, one of whom had been a young lady in the grocery store parking lot, 
just a little ways down from where it had happened. She heard the impact and the screams from people, so she ran over to see what was going on. Turned out, she had been trying to decide if she wanted to go to veterinary school or continue with her current studies in nursing, and she had a very rare opportunity to put both practices to immediate use. I laid on my stomach as she didn't flip me over to try CPR, just in case my spine was injured. She checked my pulse. Nothing. She checked for breathing. Nothing. She checked my eyes and found my pupils were fully dilated. This girl checked me three times over any signs of life. And, after a few long minutes, she said she accepted that I was gone and tried to comfort my pup who was struggling. She wrapped her up in her own sweater and she passed on the scene. At the beginning of all of this, she had instructed one of the onlookers to call 911 and it took just under 10 minutes for EMTs to arrive, which I had been quite lifeless for the duration of. The girl said she remembered tucking my puppy into her sweater off the grass, which she heard some commotion and turned to see me trying to lift it up myself. She kind of panicked because I was very dead by all accounts, and she had to keep me lying down, now even more worried about my spine, until the ambulance got there and could get me stabilized. My cell phone had flown onto the street and broken open, but a police officer, on scene, popped the battery back in and my mom ended up calling shortly afterwards, thinking I had snuck off to my high school boyfriend's house and was told about the accident. I had already been loaded into the ambulance and was on my way to the local hospital, so she rushed there herself. When she got there, they were intubating me, putting me on life support because I couldn't breathe on my own, and one of the EMTs told her they were pretty shocked that I even made it on an ambulance ride back. They made the discovery that I had a brain bleed, skull fractures, and a fractured pelvis, but the hospital didn't actually have a team qualified to work on me so they needed to get me stable enough to life flight to another city, over an hour's drive away, with a much larger hospital and capable staff. At this point, I vaguely recall coming into consciousness, feeling the tubes in my throat, hearing lots of commotion, and passing back out. I don't know how long I was there, but eventually... They got me breathing on my own long enough, but they said I had a 50-50 chance of surviving the helicopter ride to the larger hospital, but they needed to get the brain bleed drained, so they took the chance. Spoiler alert, I survived. When I arrived, I guess there was a team waiting for me and as they were about to start shaving my head to begin drilling burr holes, the surgeon told them to stop. Somehow, he was able to tell by looking at my face that the bleed was gone. They did a CT scan, and sure enough, it had disappeared. So they sent me into a surgery for my pelvis, had to place two six-inch long screws across my hips and then I was in a coma for a couple of days. My first lucid memory was coming to in the hospital, and I asked my mom why my butt hurt so bad. She told me about the metal screws in my hips. I responded that I was the bionic woman and promptly passed out again. Over the course of seven to 10 days, I was in the hospital and seemed to be healing at an absolutely astounding rate. I kept being told that it was incredible how my body was reacting to treatment, how nothing should have gone as smoothly as it did. They had been prepared for serious complications, and there just hadn't been any. I was told several times that it was amazing, 
that I even had mobility, let alone that I was alive. My mother had already arranged for a homeschool set up since there was just no way I would be going back for the remainder of the school year. But by the time I was being discharged from the hospital, I was given the go-ahead to go back to another two weeks of positive progress at home. I was absolutely on a ton of pain pills, and apparently my team of doctors asked to do a study on me. But I declined because I was terrified of needles, and they were going to require blood tests. I think had I been in a more sober state of mind, I would have said yes, because I'm very curious about how things went so well myself. My short-term memory is awful now, and I have incapacitating migraines a couple times in a year. I've got pretty bad vertigo and a tremor in my right hand, but that's kind of the worst of it. All that being said, I am now in my 30s, and ever since that event, I have just felt kind of lost like I am just existing in other people's backgrounds. It's almost a feeling of having completed my story. So now I'm just bouncing around, taking up some awkward space, like I really don't fit in here anymore. I just have such a weird feeling that it was supposed to end that night, and now I've created some kind of weird placeholder space for myself. Can anyone else relate? Is this a common NDE side effect? Something else, or am I just a little bonkers since my noggin was rocked? I was 15, and my best friend, let's call her Ari, was 14. We were huge stoners back then. Our whole friend group was. The day was so rainy, and as our friends were all skaters, it wasn't shocking that no one wanted to hang out that night. Wet ground means no skating nine times out of ten. Well, her and I still wanted to smoke a few blunts, so we went out that night. I can't recall if we left our homes and met up, or if we were already together in one of our homes and went out together. Either way, we went out and figured which of our many scythe spots would be driest. We settled on this one spot at the handball courts of my elementary school. I'm going to try and describe this spot the best I can. So, it was a yard to my elementary school where handball courts and we sat on a bench under a massive tree. In front of us was a big slope going down for the teachers to drive up or something and park, I guess. So, we would have to stand up, make a right, then a left, then walk down the slope in order to exit. And at the bottom of the slope was a huge basketball court, like ten of them all together. And behind that was a big playground. Public park property stuff, but somewhat connected to the school. Across the street was a huge patch of woods, another spot of ours, and a playground, sprinkler, basketball courts, the works, where our group would hang out when we weren't smoking. This night was so, so quiet. Not one soul was outside. Because of the wetness, I guess. And it was summer break, so adults are likely asleep preparing for work tomorrow. So, we're sitting on this bench, and we're both rolling up blunts, playing music, you know, whatever. I notice from way away, at the end of the basketball courts, and just before the playground, a huge man is just sitting there on a bench. Now, it was quite far, and it was so dark, hazy dark, like fog with street lights. but I could tell from the silhouette, he was a big dude. He's directly facing us. I tell Arya, and 
her being the more reckless of us two, she's like, dude, chill out. We're going to smoke and go. We're good. And me, being the really on guard one, could not chill out. We're smoking, and I keep telling her something isn't right. I make her turn off the music. My senses were heightened. What was this clearly grown man doing in the wet park at midnight totally alone? He himself wasn't smoking. He wasn't on his phone. Why was he stiffly facing us directly? He didn't turn his head once our entire session. I mentioned all of this to her, and towards the end of our blunt, she finally agreed something was really off. But we were leaving, so let's go, Arya insisted. Now, if you recall and understood my description, we had to walk down that ramp to exit. This also meant getting closer to that guy. Far from him, but still closer. And he'd obviously see the direction we were going for a minute or so, as it was a huge ramp. We make that right, walk for a second, make that left to head down the ramp. The whole time, me and Arya are holding each other so tightly. She's freaked out now. My eyes don't get off of the guy for even a hair of a second. I was so focused, but also freaked the fuck out. I keep telling Arya, don't run. Yeah, do not run. Please relax, relax. I was probably trying to convince myself the same, to be honest. I just felt like if we'd started running, he would know we were scared. I can't explain why, but I felt that would just make things worse. She's clutched onto me and mumbling things in my ear along the lines of, Oh shit, Anna. That's not my name, but it is for the story's sake. I'm going to shit myself. I tell her, oh, Shut up. Relax. As her talking is making it hard for me to focus. Mind you, this is all in the matter of seconds as we walk down the ramp. I tell her so sternly, no matter what happens, do not leave me. We're not even half the way down the ramp when the dude very slowly and stiffly rises up from the bench. Me and Arya grab each other tightly and pick up our pace. She keeps repeating my name out of fear. My eyes locked onto him. He's huge. Then, in one swift motion, he goes from totally frozen to darting it directly towards us. I mean, this guy was seriously running, and his legs were long. His strides were massive. The second he takes off directly after us, Arya and I drop our grip from each other and bolt it down the ramp into the middle of the road. I was on track and also cross-country. I could run a mile in about six minutes, and... My breath control was really impressive, but I was only five feet tall or so, and this guy was definitely six feet plus, and he was hungry. We're running and screaming. I keep repeating, don't leave me. All I could imagine was him grabbing one of us. I realized that I had to trust Arya to stay by my side if that happened, and I had to trust myself to attack this man if he grabbed Arya rather than me. That second part of the realization probably scared me even more than the first part. Again, this was all in the matter of a minute max. Like I said, it was totally a wasteland outside that night. So even what was usually a busier street during the day was so dead late at night in bad weather. I'm not sure why, but we, or I guess telepathically agreed to run towards where our group usually chilled when we weren't smoking. That park was across the street. It was across the street and down the block. It was a block that went around the basketball courts, so the entire run we could see the guy darting towards us and making his way onto the road right behind us. 
We thought by some small chance we'd see our friends, all boys, some quite older than us do, and be saved. We were wrong. It was deserted. I could feel us both becoming exhausted when we realized we probably wouldn't see anyone for over a mile, and that would be by absolute luck on a night like tonight. Oddly, as we continued to run, we saw a man on his bike. We ran to him begging for help, but he didn't even look at us. He almost didn't seem real. It scared the hell out of us how he ignored us and just biked away calmly as we were sweaty, hysterical, and absolutely in trouble. We ran and ran until we reached an overpass of a highway that was still empty, but at least had way more streetlights. We hadn't looked back for a while now, but when we reached the overpass, we noticed the huge guy was gone. I'm nearly 30 now. Aria passed away from a drug addiction about five years ago. We have so many wild stories together. This one not even being the craziest. I miss her dearly and wish she were still here to reminisce with me. I'm sure I probably wrote this so badly that it's not even scary. When I tried to tell my husband about it, I scared the hell out of myself, even giving me goosebumps. He too was freaked, wondering what the hell little girls were doing out so late anyways. I never even considered what would have happened to us, or me, had that guy caught up to us. I'm not sure what made him quit. Maybe he realized we were not to be fucked with, that he underestimated us. Maybe he just wanted to scare us. I'll never know, and don't really care to know either. Anyways, I wanted to share this story in my friend's honor, although I could never tell it well enough. I'm pretty sure we tried to tell our guy friends about it the next day, but they didn't believe us. Her and I never really mentioned it again, but I think about it quite often. It happened late at night, around 11 p.m., perhaps when me and my friend Andrew felt empty on our stomach. We decided to go shop at Walmart since it was open for 24 hours to buy some snacks. After arriving, the whole parking lot in itself felt uneasy. There were no other parked cars beside ours. When we successfully parked and got out, my friend teased me with scary noises. I laughed in the noise he was making, seeming to imitate a ghost, but very poorly. When I caught my breath, my friend stopped walking towards the store. I looked up at him, and his expression was nothing funny. He looked seriously frightened, wrinkles arranged in horror. I asked him what was wrong when he randomly pulled my body and whispered in my ear, A shadow is following us. He said, his voice sounding truthful. I brushed it off by declining his allegation, saying he was just messing with me. In truth, I was severely afraid myself for his random actions, almost believing him. We continued to walk towards Walmart yet again, but the aura surrounded us felt eerie that I sweat in fear. Furthermore, my friend was clutching my wrist harshly, his head looking side to side. He really was serious about what he had said. When we got inside Walmart, my body felt heavy with something I didn't know, like some pressure was pressed against me. It seemed my friend felt it too. I tried to lighten the mood with an inside joke. It only happened twice since Andrew only chuckled rather forcefully. As expected, the Walmart was deserted, save for us. I looked over at the cashier counter, and I was surprised to find nobody tending there. It mostly felt like a scene from a horror movie. Before getting some midnight stacks from the snack aisle, 
Andrew suggested that we look around at the store first. Try to find someone working, he said. I heartily agreed, admitting now how afraid I was. I even blamed him for my fear. If he only didn't scare me on our way in, I wouldn't have felt like this. But when I said the words, I couldn't help but silently admit I was being in denial, that I was truly afraid from the start. It was only then that I started to think I truly felt something following us on our way to the supermarket, as Andrew had said. By my own decisions or for my revelation from my self-denial, I did not know. We managed to find someone working at the other side of the store on another counter. There, we saw a girl in a Walmart uniform, a cashier. We brought a dozen worth of snacks to her, and she packed it up, giving us the bags and the receipt. It all happened in heavy silence. On our way back to our car, I finally admitted how I felt there was something watching us go back. Me and my friend look around for the entity that we both felt its presence. I was only halfway to our car with our bags of snacks as Andrew was behind me when he immediately ran towards my back and pushed me forward with him to the car. When we were safely there inside, doors locked, I finally understood what was going on. I looked at the back window of the car as Andrew started the engine and saw a man in all black following us with a bloody knife. Quick note, I know this was not as really satisfying of an ending, but alas, this was the truth as I know it, and it scared the ever-living shit out of me. Alrighty, dear listeners, here is a piece written in to Back to Ashes, written by Chantel. The shadow has returned once more. It dances along the walls, flickers in and out of the light. I am observing the unnatural movement of this thing with my eyes. Its limbs are twisting in bizarre ways. I cannot help but stare as it demands my attention. I have the urge to dance along with it. It's such a beautiful sight. As I rise from my bed, I am greeted by the gentle warmth of soft music. No, I pull myself under the covers, hiding from this thing. I don't recognize any of its features. I suddenly feel cold, so I glance towards the window and notice the snow falling gently. Currently, I am aware of my solitude. Gradually, I directed my gaze towards the wall. It's always present, never leaving my walls. It desires to sway with me, lift me in the air, tread on my toes, and instruct me in the art of dancing. I'm not scared, I screamed. The creature smiled and extended its black hand towards me. I dare not take it, or I'll be trapped within these walls. It pulls its long, shadowed arm back into my walls and continues to sway. Is it possible to feel both frightened and mesmerized simultaneously? Can one perceive beauty in the dark? Is it feasible to love the ugly in something? I am enamored by its graceful movements, each step captivating my gaze and sending shivers down my spine. I strongly desire to be held in its arms and move along with its rhythm. All of a sudden, it comes to a halt. The stillness replaces the desire, and fear takes over. It's coming. It's crawling out of the walls, and it is after me. My eyes grow wide. I rip the covers from my body and swing myself from my bed. I take one step after the other and don't glance behind me as I approach my door. With determination, I push it open and then 
I run fast, never looking back. I can hear it behind me. I fling open the heavy church doors and fall to the floor as snow engulfs me. I look back and see nothing. I cry for who I am and who I'll be. I reassure myself that I am safe now and nothing can harm me. However, when I witness the snowfall on Christmas Day and people buying trees and ornaments to decorate their homes, I light candles and gaze at my walls, wondering if this is the year I finally slay. Chantel, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true scary stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes, along with the gifted membership. Patty's niece, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Chrissy Elias, Denise S., Tina Mead, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, Anita V., Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Amy Klimko, Sugar Spite, and Mrs. Innerscare. Thank you all so much for remaining the pillars of which Back to Ashes still stands on. I am forever humbled and grateful for you. And now for our gifted memberships. The Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Grigg, Nat Davies, and The Cryptid Sleeps. Thank you all as well for supporting Back to Ashes. To the other memberships and people just listening, thank you all so much for keeping Back to Ashes going. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Without you being here, I would have no voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.